So um, I'd just like to say good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us for Tragedy and Survival, Ethnogenesis and Archaeology of the Freedom Seeking Peoples known as the Black Seminoles with Dr. Uzi Baram. Uh, I'm Katie Kelly and I am the Special Programs Coordinator at the Orange County Regional History Center. Our museum is located in downtown Orlando and we offer three floors of permanent exhibitions, renowned special exhibitions from the Smithsonian, and a variety of interactive unique experiences and programs for guests of all ages. While the History Center is partially funded by Orange County, donations to the Historical Society of Central Florida are vitally important to the center's ability to serve the community and continue to fulfill our mission to serve as the gateway for community engagement, education, and inspiration by preserving and sharing Central Florida's continually unfolding story. Donations allow for the care and upkeep of the historic collection, presentation of special exhibitions, and offering innovative programming. So I'm going to put a link in the chat for anyone who is interested in supporting the museum and historical society. I'll put a link in the chat so that you are able to um, find out some more about how to do that and what kind of support we need. Um, today's program is being facilitated as a webinar. So that means that attendees do not have access to your video and audio. We'll save some time at the end for questions. So please feel free to put any questions that you have for Dr. Baram and, um, in the chat as they come up and we'll address those at the end. So. Um, Anything all throughout the program, go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'll throw some reminders in there because sometimes we get to listening and we forget that we wanted to ask something. Um, and then what we'll do is at the end of the program, I'll come back on and I will facilitate those um, with our presenter today. Uh, this program is the fifth installment of our Joseph L. Breckner speaker series for this spring. This year, our series theme is Becoming Florida as we mark the bicentennial of Florida becoming a US territory in 1821. Our next installment will take place, and our next and final installment, I should say, will take place on Sunday, January 11th, um, and will feature a discussion of Florida's territorial period led by James Cusick and, Jer and Sherry Johnson, who are the authors of Andrew Jackson in Florida. Um, so without any further ado, I'm happy to introduce today's presenter. Uzi Baram directs the New College Public Archaeology Lab at New College of Florida in Sarasota, where he is also a professor of anthropology. A widely published scholar, he has been involved since 2004 with recovering and disseminating the history and heritage of Angola, an early 19th century community on the Manatee River, where Black people who had escaped from slavery made a home. So Dr. Barham, um, I'm going to turn off my mic and my camera, and you can go ahead and start sharing your screen um, and uh, facilitate it from here. I'll be listening in if anything comes up if you need anything, okay? Thank you so very much for that nice introduction. It's a real pleasure to virtually be here. And I'll start by just saying that I really like the title of this series, Discovering the People of Our Past. Uh, people is how Florida became. And by studying the peoples of our past, uh, we can figure out how Florida came to be. And one of the key, I think, findings for any historical look at Florida is that our past is marked by diversity. Uh, but not by a simple martyr of diversity, but a complicated, even messy and confusing history of names, individuals, and as hopefully I'll show, fluid identities. As an archaeologist, I'm fascinated by the social dynamics of the last two centuries, from a place that had 60,000 people at statehood in 1845 to more than 20 million today. And there's just such a robust history beneath our feet one that the uh, more that we know about, the more that we can appreciate what's here and hopefully make good choices for our future. Uh, according to the historian Jane Landers, at the end of the second Spanish period, 200 years ago, there was about 1300 whites and 1800 blacks in Florida. She doesn't give the numbers for the Miccosukee and Seminole people, but of the non-indigenous people on this peninsula, uh, more than half were of African heritage and so I want to spend time today looking at that majority. Nearly a decade ago, the National Park Service held its National Underground Railroad Conference in St. Augustine to highlight which is the southern route of the Underground Railroad, the less known route, of course, the one to the north, to Canada, is well known. And as part of their endeavor, the Park Service facilitated the inclusion of Black Seminoles in the conference. And it was a wonderful place to be, to learn, and to really think hard about the courage and determination that allowed so many to break chattel slavery and find liberty in Florida. I want to provide some clarity on this uh, and to really honor the people who are shown here in this image. 
uh, the descendants of those who found freedom and liberty here. Uh, the Black Seminoles are a tremendously important part of the history of Florida and of the United States in general. Uh, their diaspora spans from Mexico all the way to the Bahamas as the map shows. And we're gonna be thinking hard about the question, who are Black Seminoles? And I think it's a really interesting question to ask about what was going on here in Florida, the traditional homelands of the ancestors of the Seminole Miccosukee people. There is scholarship. I won't be giving citations along the way, except for a couple of key moments, uh, but I do want you just to see some of those titles of books that have wrestled with these questions, as well as the reenactments that occur that give a sense of what was going on and how Black Seminoles came to be and how that made Florida what it is today. I'll be arguing that 200 years ago, 1821, was a really important moment, not just because Spain handed over Florida to the United States, but because of a tragedy that occurred. And even though there was a tragedy in Tampa Bay 200 years ago, people survived. And that survival is what I'll lay out as Black Seminole identity. The inspiration for that uh, approach and for this public talk and my others comes from the Black feminist intellectual Bell Hooks, who's seen on the top of the slide, who wrote once, we have to excavate, look, and talk about it all. So I'm going to try to bring in as many factors as possible. I'll also later in the presentation talk about this uh, newspaper story that Cantor Brown Jr., a historian then at the Tampa Bay History Center, brought forward that helps us make sense of what occurred 200 years ago. So as you heard, uh, I'm Uzi Baram, Professor of Anthropology at New College of Florida. I'll offer a historical view on the Black Seminoles of Florida. And we'll think about some of these issues that try to bring out via historical archeology, span the places of freedom across the peninsula and lay out some of the dynamics that uh, provide a sense of these people who already you've seen, I'll be using multiple names for. That multiplicity of names is just representative of a time of tremendous change. That the words that I'll be using uh, are trying to fix identities which were shifting greatly uh, 200 years ago. When I think about the people who are the focus uh, for the presentation, here's just some of the names that get used for them. Uh, exiles, exiled, uh, escaped slaves, self-emancipated people, freedom-seeking people, African Seminoles, of course, Black Seminoles, Atlantic Creoles, and the one that you're going to hear me use uh, most of all, because the one I'm most comfortable with, because we're dealing mostly with the uh, Spanish Florida in this presentation in the Spanish Caribbean, has this term of maroon, uh, people who escaped enslavement, were fighting for their freedom, and whose descendants were living in freedom as free people. And when I use the term maroonage, uh, thinking of two different types of communities of maroons, the ones where it's just individuals leaving, running away from the plantations and enslavement and trying to make it on their own. And then the grand maroonage, where no matter how people escaped, how they were living, they came together. Within uh, this term of Black Seminole, we're going to think about, uh, we can bring up the ones in Oklahoma, uh, the ones in Mexico, the ones on Andros Island, Bahamas. But this presentation, even though it's going to be fairly long at about 40 minutes, is going to just lay out the dynamics uh, for Florida and its connections to Andros Island. As I go through the presentation, here are just some key dates. Uh, 1513, when Ponce de Leon uh, cited the peninsula and named it La Florida uh, and started Spanish rule, uh, 1763 to 1783 when Britain ruled, 1783 to 1821 when it was Spanish territory, again, the second Spanish period as it's known, uh, 1821, 200 years ago when the US took it, 
and then statehood in 1845. For the Maroonage, uh, here are some more dates that fit within that uh, sequence. And as part of that sequence, and what the map on the left shows is some of those places. And we start by St. Augustine in the northeast part of uh, the state in a place known as Fort Mose. There was a competition between the Spanish Empire and the British Empire uh, that fell along the lines of what's now the Georgia Florida line. St. Augustine was the major city for Spanish La Florida on the East Coast. And in recognition of the challenge of protecting that city, the Spanish uh, King Charles II proclaimed in, eight, in 1693 that anyone who escaped uh, British slavery in the American colonies came to St. Augustine, declared loyalty to the Spanish crown and accepted Catholicism could live as free people. It's such a simple point, but so profoundly important to recognize. No one wants to be enslaved. And so people took tremendous risks, running away from plantations in what's now South Carolina and Georgia, taking a risk that going south through the swamps, they would find a haven of liberty in St. Augustine. And we know of so many who did. We don't know of those who didn't make it. We do know of those who made it. And the numbers were high enough that by 1738, the Spanish governor created a community just north of St. Augustine, Fort Muse, for these uh, people of African heritage. Uh, they were known as black warriors. Uh, when the British came down to try to conquer St. Augustine, they came across Fort Muse first. And these people fought not just for the Spanish crown, but for their very bodies. So they wouldn't be taken into enslavement. The first Fort Muse only lasted a couple of years. It got rebuilt and lasted about a dozen years after that. When the British came and took uh, Spain, uh, took Spanish Florida, the people of Fort Muse either left with the Spanish to Havana or went into the interior. Uh, historians still don't know much about that. These were not people who wanted to be found, who didn't want to be known of what their lives were like. And so we have very little in terms of a record of them. Well, we kind of move forward through those decades. And then after the American Revolution, the Spanish come back. Florida does not want to become part of the newly created United States. And Britain decides to hand it over to back to Spain. And that starts the second Spanish period. And then we start seeing again, then African-Americans, uh, the people of African heritage, starting to organize. And one of the important places that occurs is in the Panhandle. Uh, on the Apalachicola River that you see here on the left, which was then a major river for the peoples of Georgia and what's now Alabama to send their agricultural goods down to the Gulf of Mexico. In the context of the War of 1812, the British were organizing Native Americans and people of African heritage to fight against the United States. And thanks to research by the historian, uh, Nate Millett, we have a really good sense of the Maroons of Prospect Bluff on the Apalachicola River. People started gathering by the hundreds in this place because of Edward Nichols, who was a British officer who had promised people of African heritage that if they joined the British cause against the United States, and you can see the quote here uh, that Millet uh, found by the speech, that they would be allowed to live as free people. And similar to the proclamation by the Spanish crown, people who are enslaved rallied to that cry for freedom. And they came into the hundreds to a, what the British created as a fort on the Apalachicola River. Uh, please excuse the language of the time when the American eyes, it was known as, and this is the quote, the Negro Fort. I'll just keep on referring to it as the Prospect Bluff Fort. Correctly, Andrew Jackson, who had won a great victory 
for the United States at the Battle of New Orleans, recognized it as a threat, a threat to the slave regime. And Andrew Jackson ordered the US Navy in the Gulf of Mexico to go up the Apalachicola River and attack the Fort at Prospect Bluff. And in July, 1618, and this is, we get this from the US Naval records, uh, a lucky shot blew up the magazine, killing 300 people in the fort. A couple hundred people had been captured, but, and this will be a theme throughout this talk, that tragedy of hundreds dying, hundreds being taken into enslavement, others survived. We have at Prospect Bluff today, just some small remembrances of that very important fort. Uh, this is an image of my three kids running uh, over the area from a long, long time ago. Uh, an excavation in the early 1960s recovered some of the things that were at the fort. Some not really surprising, of course, military hardware, uh, dining wares, barrels, tobacco pipes, uh, the things that the British supplied for the people of African heritage and Native Americans at this maroon site. Working with a digital archeologist, we're able to create a reconstruction. And so what you see here is what this fort might've looked like back just before its destruction. Apologies for the wrong, the typo and the date and the photo, it's 1816. The British flag and the red flag. This was a place meant to fight for freedom. The British under Nichols had trained people to be soldiers. And if it wasn't for that, quote, lucky shot, according to the US Navy, uh, it was a tremendous threat. Here's just another image of it that what's in the center is that magazine that a uh, cannonball hit and blew the place up with. The ones who survived went south. And they went south to the Suwannee River, where the great Seminole leader, Billy Bowlegs, had a town. And under Billy Bowlegs, there was protection for the, the Maroons. And they settled and they started reconstructing their lives. Uh, the model that we have is that they started growing crops. They had horses and cows and other animals. Uh, small farmsteads is the image. Andrew Jackson knew of this. He knew that there had been survivors from the Prospect Bluff battle. And he, on, with the Tennessee volunteers, went into Spanish La Florida and attacked. We have a sketch map uh, from one of his lieutenants showing the Suwannee River, showing in the square, uh, Billy Bowleg's town of a nucleated community. And all these dots are you know, the hamlets for the Maroons as they're trying to reconstruct their lives. We have the information from the US military records that lay out that the black warriors, as they were called, held off the US military. They held them off long enough that the people living in the communities, in those houses, uh, in those cabins, were able to escape southward. And when they finally were able to, they fell back and the US military came in, saw the houses, saw the cabins, saw the fields, took them all, uh, but found very few people, uh, but declared victory. Uh, for the last five years, uh, the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, working with archeologists has been excavating at uh, Suwannee, bringing out some of that archeological information on the Suwannee community. In most, of the histories on the Seminoles and on Black Seminoles, the story usually kind of ends there, that there was a battle well known in its time at, um, on the Apalachicola River, another battle at Suwannee in 1818, and then kind of a blank period of time for a couple of decades. But Andrew Jackson's men knew that people had escaped. Uh, James Glanson, who's quite famous for lots of different reasons, wrote that Tampa Bay was the last rallying spot for these Maroons and Native Americans. This is where they were able to connect up with Spanish and British emissaries, where they're able to regroup. 
and research suggested that maybe that Tampa Bay area was on the Manatee River, one of the four rivers that drain into Tampa Bay. Archivally, we had so little information. John Lee Williams, who wrote, famously wrote the territory of Florida in 1837, lays out, again, using the language of the time, the point between two rivers, he's referring to the, what's now the Manatee River, then known as the Oyster River and the Braden River, was a place where, and these are two of the British filibusters, the British supporters of the Maroons, had a plantation. When they say plantation, they just mean for agricultural community cultivated by 200 people. And in 1837, the domestic utensils and their cabins were still seen on the old fields. Well, some of that was organized by the historian I showed you earlier, Cantor Brown Jr. He had found that newspaper story, he had read through some of those military records and he was able to this turn that there was a community there. It seemed to have had two names. One was Sarasota, which is now the name, of course, of the contemporary town I live in, and the other was Angola. And he published it in a journal, put it in a book he had published, and scholars knew of it. In 2004, 15 years ago, a community scholar, Vicki Oldham, came across that reference and decided it was important to actually know where Angola was, where this maroon community was to raise its profile. And she organized an interdisciplinary research team that include, included Cantor Brown Jr. and others and myself as well, and started a task which she referred to as looking for Angola. We started in 2005 with public presentations funded by the Florida Humanities Council. I was able to get volunteers to help out as well as new college students, uh, new college undergraduates to do excavations in a place that was uh, preserved by reflections of Manatee on the Manatee River. It was slow going. We we're trying to make sense of the material record. We we're trying to make sense of the stratigraphic information and also trying to figure out what was going on and how would people have been living here if these are the survivors from Prospect Bluff, from Swanee and maybe other free blacks who had been in the center of the peninsula. But over what well, was basically a 10 year period, we pulled together those fragments and I was able to announce in 2014 that we had found material traces of Angola. I filed that with the Florida Master site file and then started working on, as a public archeologist, ways to share that information disseminated outside just scholarly audiences. Uh, one of the people who was tremendously important is in the top right, Sherry Speckus, uh, then the president of Time Sifters Archaeological Society, which is a Sarasota Manatee branch of the Florida Anthropological Society. And we worked together to create heritage interpretation signs. You see that at the bottom middle of the slide. Uh, we created those digital reconstructions. I showed you the one from Prospect Bluff. We, I'll show you in a little while the one from Angola that's hinted there. And this was able to kind of share that archaeological insight with more people, very much within Vicki Oldham's vision. Uh, Daphne Towns, you see at the bottom right, it was a Brayton resident who one day just walked past the heritage interpretation sign, sign for Angola, where we mentioned that people escaped and had got into Andros Island in the Bahamas, which that's where she was from. And she excitedly contacted myself and others. And in what seemed like just a matter of a couple of months, organized a festival known as Back to Angola, where she had invited members of her family, her neighbors from Red Bays and Andros Island to come to Bradenton and celebrate their heritage in the place where their ancestors had found liberty. And in July of 2018, and then again, July of 2019, uh, Daphne organized just wonderful celebrations that really brought out the spirit of what was there. Sherry Speckus, then who was vice president of Reflections of Manatee, where, the prep, where we had done the excavations, put forward a proposal to the National Park Service. And in 2019, uh, they accepted that yes, the Manatee River, this community of Angola was part of the network to freedom, the Southern route 
of the Underground Railroad, that vision of actually finding the place that was put forward 15 years ago had been fulfilled. And we had got in, and I had got in uh, affirmation that my analysis and interpretation was correct. There was actually tremendous excitement in Bradenton, as well as surrounding communities, about that Underground Railroad connection. Uh, to some extent, that excitement led to something that caused great worry for me. That's the only way to describe it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, being kind to myself, I actually create panic. Uh, Bradenton has a really successful entertainment district known as Riverwalk, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a walking area right on the south side of the Manatee River, uh, started a decade ago. Well, with this find uh, and other factors, the city of Brainton and the nonprofit Realize Brainton decided to expand Riverwalk all the way to this little park where we had done our excavations. Luckily, the city of Brainton decided to fund large scale excavations in January 2020. You see just some of the images here from the work. I was able, lucky enough, to get a really great team in January 2020 uh, that had a whole month to do a tremendous amount of excavating to really put forward much more information than the small amount of excavation units I had put in previously. The Division of Historical Resources uh, provided work for the laboratory research that lasted from August 2020 to February 2021. So what you're gonna hear in a few moments is really new information, things that uh, I've been organizing, putting together in a report, uh, but I'm really happy to share with you all. The work was uh, successful. That those previous excavations gave us a really good framework. The area by the Manatee Mineral Spring, a source of fresh water within sight of the Manatee River, had long been a place that people found refuge. Uh, there was a pre-Columbian mound on the area. Uh, the Spanish had passed by and mapped the region. The Maroons had come, starting a uh, positive in the 1770s, and then 1841, 20 years after the destruction of the community, uh, Anglo-Americans came and created the village of Manatee. And so what we had as a project was the opportunity to expose a large area in order to find out, and this is an anthropologist, is always the goal, the daily lives of the people who live there. We had to go, because it's part of the ethical obligation of archeology, span to go through all the layers to reveal some of the ways of life of the 19th century people who created the village of Manatee that grew into the city of Brainton. But what really animated the project was an opportunity to go deep down and find some of the evidence for the Angola community. Uh, this drone shot, and you can see the cars and the buckets and the people give you a sense of the scale of the excavations. We're able to move a lot of dirt, to, to say it uh, simply. And in moving a lot of dirt, we're able to just see a lot of what had been there. And part of the rationale I'll say for doing it is as I'm speaking now in late May, 2021, uh, Bulldozers are transforming the area, creating ponds and lagoons. Uh, if we hadn't done the excavations, all the archeological information I'm about to share with you would have been lost. So this was very much salvaging things before the transformation of the landscape to create the new park for Riverwalk. Uh, if anyone has uh, experience with archeology, span this is really exciting. If you don't, just I'll give it just the brief uh, description. Uh, this is trigraphy, and this is kind of how we unlock the history going through the ages. Uh, the representation of grass, of course, is the ground surface. Right under it was a layer that was basically early 21st century and late 20th century rubble. Uh, the park had been evened out uh, for use as a playground, and there was a lot of rubble just under it that uh, slightly darker brown soil was material from the very end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Much again was uh, 
rubble from a time when this was part of a city, uh, very much urban archaeology. As we go deeper, the darker soil uh, was the village of Manatee. This uh, settlement started in 1841 that just grew and grew and grew. And so we had a lot of the material evidence, a lot of materials from those people, an initial set of families that came under the Armed Occupation Act and then expanded their holdings, lots of changes in ownership. And as typical for people in any time period, a lot of materials left. It's only those little dark spots that you see here. It's discontinuous over the area that we excavated, but in those little spots was the layers for Angola. People had lived there for only, uh, in some cases, only a few years. In general, only a couple of decades. It's a short habitation site, just like Port Muse, just like Prospect Bluff, just like Swanee. But in those small little remnants, we were able to reveal so much of the daily lives of these Maroons. I'm still doing the research, so I don't have everything to share with you right now, but I'm gonna at least share with you some of those materials. We had to go down fairly deep, remove a lot of material, and all of which will be, uh, has been examined, all of which is cataloged, all of which will be interpreted to get to that Angola level. And one of the things we found, and again, all this is still interpretations, there's still gonna be more vetting of all the information, but I started doing this research 15 years ago by trusting my audiences, by sharing what we had and what we were asking and looking for input from the public. And so I'm continuing with that policy of trust, of sharing, and uh, hopefully uh, if I need to be corrected, people will correct me. If I'm right, hopefully people will be supportive and if we can expand the interpretation, all the better. And what you see here really surprised us. Uh, one, because of the really nice preservation in place that had very poor preservation overall. And two, there was a freshwater spring nearby. But on the right, you see a wooden box and some wood on top of it. When we excavated through the muck in this box, you can see it really nice on the left, uh, we found a barrel well. And a barrel well is exactly what it sounds like. It's sometimes archaeology is fairly simple. Uh, the people had dug a hole down, they put some wood four-sided to keep it steady, and then they took a barrel, took off the tops and the bottom, and put it in the ground. And because the water level table is not that uh, low, fresh water gushed up. And in fact, when we cleaned out the muck of two centuries, fresh water bubbled up through it. And what you see in this photo on the left is actually, and it's a little, maybe a little too creative, uh, but an image of one of the excavators in the reflection in this barrel well. Uh, I can say, and if anyone has ideas, that's where the chat is just wonderful. Uh, why, when there was a source of fresh water, would people build a well really within just 50 meters of it, just tremendously close. We know a lot of the buildings for the village of Manatee, and they describe their houses, they describe their pathways, uh, almost all the details of their landscape, and no one mentions a well. And so both from its place in the stratigraphy and the fact that the later people didn't mention it, we associate this with the Maroon community. We have some materials being analyzed by the Bureau of Archaeological Research as I speak right now in May 2020. Hopefully they'll be able to help us a little bit with the dating. The materials imply it in fact was built by the Maroons. As we think about these people, some of whom had been trained as soldiers at Prospect Bluff and had suffered that terrible tragedy uh, in July 1816, some of who had escaped to Swanee and again had rebuilt their lives, but then attacked again, had to flee with only what they could carry. We don't have that much of a sense from that historic record who these people are. And so during the excavations, when we saw and it circled here, we saw a stain in the ground that was rectangular. So I told my crew to go carefully. Uh, those stains, and we find lots of stains like that, is usually because there was wood and the wood under the wet conditions of Florida rots away, but there's a signature 
the dark stain says something was there. And so we saw the rectangle. They started excavating, going down through it fairly slowly. And what we found was the entire dog skeleton. Uh, thanks to Diane Wallman, professor of anthropology, University of South Florida at Tampa, who did the identification for this project. Uh, the dog was less than, was about 20 inches high, weighed almost 50 pounds. Uh, Diane Wallman tells me it was about the size of a Border Collie or Australian Shepherd, if you know your dog types. Uh, there's a type of dog known as a Carolina dog that's considered the indigenous dog of uh, the east coast of the US, sometimes known as the Seminole dog here in Florida. And that's what it might look like. As we think about daily life, what we infer, and archeologists always infer, right? We have to just kind of pull pieces together that someone had a dog. And when that dog died, they took it and put it in a rectangular box and buried it. And if we wanna get a sense of the humanity of these maroons living at, by the Manatee Mineral Spring, I think this is just something that really touches everyone when they think about that relationship between a person or people and a dog and that caring for this dog, even as they were living under such fear of warfare and capture, that sense of just giving it a place to rest. Uh, of the other parts, and again, we have so, so much, I'm not gonna go through everything. I'm just gonna try to give you some of the highlights as we're organizing it. We found another interesting part. And what you see here is complicated. The excavations were complicated. They were difficult. Uh, we found post molds and a post mold again is what it sounds like. You take a post, a wooden post, put it in the ground uh, for whatever reason, fire or removal or just rotting in place, there's a dark stain in the ground. It's distinctly round and it goes down deep. So we know what it is at the same level. And the uh, four of us are standing where we found four post molds all at the same level. We thought, well, maybe this was the post for uh, some kind of cabin that it was there. And so when we were doing the excavation in that middle place, I'd asked the crew to go a little slow and a little more carefully. And what they found was two pits next to each other, but two very uh, clearly created pits separate in the middle of this structure. And one of those pits, and this thing you see on the left, was made out of glass and just regular glass from bottles, uh, flaked to be half a projectile point, uh, otherwise known as our head. And in this pit, in the center of the floor of this cabin, someone placed this object. In the other pit, they placed this, and you know, the term we started using just to simplify things was the G-shaped object. And we've had several suggestions. And again, I welcome anyone who wants to offer suggestions, or if you know, even better with a reference to it. Uh, maybe an ornament to hold a cloak together, maybe an ornament for a pistol. Uh, we've heard several different possibilities for it. But what we have, and again, this is the inference. Trying, we don't have the people themselves to tell us what they were doing or why they were doing it. But in this cabin, which had a dirt floor, someone or someone's buried two objects fairly deep in the ground one next to each other, then covered it up, and for whatever reason, never went back to it, whether because the community was destroyed or they just wanted to leave it there. Uh, in archaeological terminology, and, and sometimes archaeologists get mocked for saying this, uh, so I put that forward, we call this ritual behavior, right? And yes, it's left to be vague, but some kind of sense that this was purposeful, to call in something more significant than what's around us. And so this is some of the, again, evidence of people's lives and some ritual behavior that they engaged in. We found, and the term I use, and I, I've been pretty consistent in it, is belongings. Uh, and older archeology span uh, would use the term artifacts, anything made by people. And there's nothing wrong with that term but I try to impress upon my crew and when I teach my classes at New College of Florida to think of these things as belongings. They belong to someone. 
someone had a uh, pearl ware, which you see at the bottom of the screen. It was a British mass produced ware. These people at Angola on the Manti River in the very beginning of the 19th century conceived of themselves as British subjects. Nichols had, Lieutenant Nichols had promised them that they fought with the British, they could live as free people as British subjects. And so the things they used was British mass produced materials eating off of British made plates, but that kind of ethos. The other one also is British made with a nice low design. And what you see on the left is an earthenware vessel, fairly large, and actually the only earthenware vessel we found among all the many things. And so we're still making sense of the ceramics. Uh, we have a sense of some of the merchants who were trading with the Maroons, uh, where these had come from, uh, but we're starting to piece together the kind of taste they had for materials, right? One of the things, again, we want to keep in mind, the Manatee River area, Tampa Bay, was for the Americans a frontier, for Spain an afterthought. But these were not people living in some kind of other time. They were living at the beginning of the 19th century, part of global affairs. They knew of the Haitian Revolution. They knew of the uprisings against slave holders on the German coast. They knew of the American Revolution, that promise of liberty. They knew of the French Revolution. Uh, they were interacting with Native Americans, with Cuban fishermen, with British merchants, with Spanish uh, administrators. They were part of the world and they were living a life they wanted to live in freedom, although this in Spanish, La Florida by the Manatee River. We found pieces of wood and this one in particular held up by one of the New College of Florida students uh, is what we saw once we cleaned the wood. And it seems pretty clearly architectural. We have a sense, and again, that comes from that John Lee Williams description, they had cabins, right? Not huts, not chickies, but cabins. And still doing some research on it. Again, if anyone has some knowledge of building wooden cabins in Florida in this time period, uh, I'll appreciate even more insights in it. We have uh, some of the scholarship is organized for us already, but made holes in the wood. You can see the piece on the on the right side of it to kind of uh, make pull it together. Uh, we did find plenty of nails, but they probably didn't have enough nails to actually nail everything together. And so they modified the wood to fit their needs. We're still going through some of the wooden pieces and preserving them so that we can start figuring out if we do have pieces of their cabins. One of the belongings that surprised us, and maybe not you because I just showed you that flaked uh, projectile point, was flake glass. Uh, archaeologists know of this phenomenon from seminal sites in the middle of Florida, from the middle of the state. Uh, we looked at this and at first it was kind of curious. We, we ended up making a connection to the Seminoles. Uh, there's not much stone at all in Tampa Bay and none on the Manatee River. It's just all sand. But there's a need, lots of needs, for sharp objects. Of course, much of North America, of course, people use flint, flint napped, made projectile points and blades and scrapers and other things to make things with. Uh, no such luck uh, on the Manatee River. And so it seems that these Maroons took bottle glass, broke it, and flaked it to make uh, various types of scraping tools. And we found a good amount of this. And this is also a piece that tells us about their lives that we're still trying to pull everything together. Uh, this is Diane Wallman who did the finding for the dog burial. Uh, she went through and listed for us all the animal bones uh, that we have for the entire site. Uh, you see in the upper left, butchered cow bones and an image of a Spanish cow, a crack of cow. Uh, the Maroons had such animals, so did the village of Manatee. Uh, the Spanish, of course, brought wild boar or boar, and the pigs are there. The Maroons had chickens. Uh, the possum was a, a burial of possum. It came from later, but it was kind of curious to have it. Squirrels, sheep, goats, another dog, even a cat. We just have uh, almost 5,000 different types of critters. 
uh, that we're trying to make sense of. Much of the evidence comes from the later periods from the village of Manatee and then the city of Brainton, but some of it clearly associated uh, with the Maroon community. So we can start talking about eating beef and other sorts of things. And of course, being right on the Manatee River, right by the Gulf of Mexico, uh, no surprise, a lot of fish bones. We haven't gone through all the fish bones yet, or the otolites, the ear bones, and I hope our archaeologists, cell archaeologists, identify different types of fish. It was known as the Oyster River for good reason, lots of oysters. And uh, one of our crew members was able to even notice there were crab shells, just little pieces of it, but very clearly crab. And so the marine substance as, as well, the animals that they ate. Uh, it was a rich biozone. Again, we don't need to shell, sell these people short. They were living robust lives in freedom as they were reconstructing it uh, on the Manatee River. We're still doing a lot of research. Uh, some of the objects are recognizable. Uh, the clay tobacco pipe you see there. Uh, again, part of the things that the British would bring. Uh, maybe they grew their own tobacco. Maybe they traded for tobacco that we don't know yet. But we find enough of the tobacco pipes. And they're quite recognizable and quite datable. And some of them clearly date from the Angola period. And then there's things that we haven't recognized. Uh, one of my professors uh, long ago, uh, said to me, uh, said to others, uh, that archaeologists always want to find something new, interesting, and different, and then they don't know what it is because it's different and new and no one's seen it before. And again, if anyone has some thoughts, uh, what you see on the right was made out of wire. You can see the little loops. Some of these also had weights on it. It seems like it was a metal a wire netting for fishing. What we don't know is when it might have been used, uh, just the way the strigraphy played out. It's not quite clear. It goes into the maroon levels, uh, but it's also in later levels. And so we're not quite sure uh, about whether it got mixed in uh, or and if it got mixed into the more recent things or into the older things. Uh, mostly people, of course, used organic material uh, for making fishing nets uh, and still do. So we're not quite sure about this and we haven't uh, gotten any good answers. The research process will go on for a while. There's always gonna be more clarification on the materials and understanding what these things were, where they came from, how people use them and why they use them for particular ways. We, able, we didn't have uh, much luck with pollen analysis, uh, the cycles of wet and dryness uh, didn't provide the right kind of preservation. But we do have from uh, John Lee Williams an account of these maroon fields. Uh, we have an account from Josiah Gates. He's the one who came in 1841 to claim uh, the Manti Mineral Springs. And he found dried corn stalks and a few pumpkins. And then, and I'll, I'll bring this back into the conversation in a few minutes. Uh, we know that some people escaped with corn, peas, and pumpkins to the Bahamas. And so we have a sense of their food waste, tomatoes, lima beans, corn, peas, pumpkins, and herbs, as well as the fish from the river and bay, the deer and other game from the interior, and the domesticated animals they had like cow and sheep and goat and chickens. We start getting a sense of this world, this cultural landscape for these maroons. And as we lay out what we have, everything I've shown you has come from just one small place by the Manti Mineral Spring. When I look at that map for the Swanee community, I think about how people might have lived their lives after the traumas of Prospect Bluff and the Battle of Swanee. And I don't think they would live in a nucleated area. They were afraid of being captured. Constant fear. Uh, as Difficult as it is to repeat it, there are people who saw these human beings as property, property to be taken and sold or used for their labor. And so they were diffuse over the area. The accounts we have from the Manti River down to Sarasota Bay. And so just imposing the map, right? Not very sophisticated analysis, uh, but it would have been strewn basically from the Manti River down to uh, where New College of Florida is today, small, little, diffused uh, hamlets 
each with their fields and the domesticated animals as they're trying to take care of their elderly and raising their young in freedom and liberty in this area. We just happen to have excavated at one particular place of uh, this much larger community. And so here are the inferences. Right? Use of British mass produced goods, seminal style glass flaking, a robust agricultural community with livestock and pets, along with uh, marine resources. And while that presence by the Manatee Mineral Spring is clearly really important, there's another presence that we know about under what's called the Braiding Castle, uh, an 1841 big house for a plantation that during the Third Seminole War was considered a, a quote, castle as a fort for protection against the Seminoles during those awful wars, and hamlets all the way south to Sarasota Bay. There's so much more work to be done, even though we have a good deal of information from this one spot. Uh, I mentioned doing those digital reconstructions. I had earlier shown you the one from Prospect Bluff. Uh, this is a sense of those cabins, uh, the spring going through the center of the community to the Manatee River. On the right, the little mound, the rise is a pre-Columbian mound and in the foreground, some crops, a community, people living in freedom. And it ends. This is back to that earlier a uh, newspaper story from Cantor Brown Jr. These are people facing threats to their bodies and to their lives. Just as Spain was transferring Florida to the United States, Andrew Jackson requested permission to go into Florida and capture people he considered property. The Secretary of War at the time, what's now the Secretary of Defense, John Calhoun, denied him, said no to Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jackson had allies and he sent them in. And it's, of course, that's uh, interpretation. Uh, and they went into Florida and this newspaper account says that it occurred in the summer of 1821 and they arrived and here's one of the terms for the community. I've been using Angola, but Sarasota is the other name of it. Captured 300 people, plundered their plantation, i.e. their fields and set fire to their houses, and then went down to Charlotte Harbor and attacked again. And these are the, the Cuban fishing ranchos that were destroyed. And this has always chills me when I read it, the terror that spread among the Western coast of East Florida and broke all the establishments. They fled. Well, as much as this was a tragedy and trying to imagine people had built their homes, grew their crops, had their animals, were raising their children, taking care of their elderly, and then the slavery comes and destroys everything, capturing 300. It doesn't end there. Some of the people who survived fled across the what's now the Everglades and got to the British Bahamas because they had been promised they could live in British lands and in freedom. And so British military, Cuban fishermen, and others got them to Andros Island on the Bahamas, the large closest island. Uh, of the Bahamas to uh, Florida. Professor Rosin Howard of the University, then of the University of Central Florida, she's retired now, had done ethnographic work in the Bahamas on Andros Island. And she was curious about this question of where the people she was studying, working with, living with, collaborating with came from. There was information from 1823 of the people who had been captured. Many of them had never been enslaved. They were born in freedom in Florida. And so there are lawsuits about them. But if you look carefully on the one on the left from July 1823, uh, two years after the destruction, it shows that Prince and Scipio ran away. So they'd been captured, but they ran away. And what Rosin did was saw another letter from a British customs officer talking about Florida, uh, the term that was used in this, Florida Negroes, it can excuse me, excuse my language, but that's the, what was put on the letter. Scipio and Peter are listed there. This is as good of evidence you can have that individuals who had been in Angola, had been captured, but had escaped, got to the Andros Island, to this place known as Red Bays. These people at Red Bays knew their ancestors had come from Florida. Uh, Ms. Marshall, who you see at the bottom with Professor Howard, was the granddaughter of Scipio Bolex. 
She's actually famous in the community for creating this basket style, uh, made of sweet grass. Uh, she has since passed away. Uh, I got to meet them before they passed away. The Reverend Newton back in 1968 wrote a history of Red Bay talking about his ancestors having come from Florida, but they didn't know exactly where. What we did through this research was find that evidence that the ancestors had lived on the south side of the Manitou River, had lived at Angola, and from Angola with its destruction in 1821, they escaped to the Bahamas and they and their descendants to the Reverend Newton, to Ms. Marshall and their descendants have been able to live in freedom and liberty. Others though, moved inland. And one of the places that they went to uh, was Minetti. And uh, Cantor Brown Jr., the historian, thinks that actually was a play on the name Manatee. Uh, but they moved, they started again, creating a new way of life in the center of the peninsula. And one of the things that uh, is not at all surprising is they were fiercely interested and committed to sustaining their autonomy and their freedom. And so, and some of you know this, if you know Florida history, in December, 1835 from Tampa Bay, a military detachment went all the way up to what's now Ocala, then Fort King, and there was an ambush. And that ambush was people of African heritage and Seminoles. And that ambush, sometimes called the Dale Battle, but I think ambush is the more correct uh, site uh, term, uh, killed 100 American soldiers, allowing just three to survive, to tell of what had happened. And that launched the Second Seminole War. And that was, as some of you, I think, uh, aware, is often known as the largest slave uprising, uh, at Black uprising in American history, lasting for eight years, uh, tremendously challenging notion. It, of course, didn't end things. There was another war. But as the Seminoles like to remind us correctly, uh, they were never conquered. And I'm just showing this picture of Atatiki, uh, the place to learn on the Big Cypress Reservation where the Seminoles able to tell of this long 19th century set of battles the US had against them and that they were always able to sustain their freedom. So that's a lot of history and there's a lot going on. It's during that second Seminole War that that term Black Seminole uh, solidifies. And so they start becoming known as Black Seminoles. And so when I think about who those people were, in the early 19th century that became, after 1835, commonly known as Black Seminoles. Well, I've been using Maroons. I've also used that term, freedom-seeking people from Ira Berlin, the famous historian, Atlantic Creoles. Because as we know from the Second Seminole War and the Third Seminole War, uh, most of these Seminoles, uh, Black Seminoles, had, were multilingual. They knew English and Spanish, Seminole, Miccosukee, Creek, uh, probably other languages as well. Plastic uh, cultural plasticity were able to deal with lots of cultural differences and were incredibly socially adept. This are some of the people that created Florida, right? That initial theme I began with. This is part of that diversity. Jane Landers, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk as well, the historian in a book, Atlantic Creoles in the Age of American Revolutions, uh, lays that out in an earlier book, Black Society, Spanish, Florida, notes that as the landscape, economy, and racial social systems were being reshaped, so was the historic production, right? That sense of history is made by the winners. And so we need to think about how things were written and how they've been changed. And she's quite clear that the past was bleached and homogenized till it looked less Caribbean and more Southern American. But she argued back in 1999, Immigration is once again making Florida part of the Afro-Hispanic Caribbean, changing the way it sounds and it looks and sounds. From her perspective, this re-blending of people is a return to that way of life in the early 19th century and is part of our future. So we look back so that we can see where we had come from and frankly, maybe where we're going. And so we can look at Florida, not just for how much it's grown, but from 1693, King Charles proclaiming, you can come here and be free 
1814, when Sir Edward Nichols says, if you stay with us, if you fight for freedom with us, you can live in freedom, to 1835, Abraham, the famous Black Seminole leader known from the Second Seminole War for his diplomacy with the US government, again, proclaiming freedom. These others were outsiders from uh, Abraham, who was probably born and raised in Florida and probably was at Angola early in his life. A sense that the freedom comes from within and no longer from without. This project, as we've been opening it up, as we're trying to make sense of it, one of the excavators was a descendant from the Angola community whose parents grew up in Red Bay's Andros Island. James, uh, Jason Brown was trained as an archeologist. And when he came and joined us, uh, he was able to give us a much better sense of the significance of it. And during an interview with the local news station, and just quoting him here, that very emotional feeling to know that you're walking the ground then knowing the historic circumstances, which they, referring to his ancestors, desired to be free. I'm only free because they desired to be free. Vicki Oldham, who started this research back 15 years ago, has talked about the spirit of Angola, that sense of freedom that just ripples through the ages. And so whether it was the Back to Angola Festival, the Network to Freedom designation, uh, the work we did in doing the excavations, the lab work, and now exhibits that are coming up, already one at Reflections of Manatee, that historic preservation organization, one coming up at the State Ringling Museum of Art, able to share that passion for freedom with people today. That spirit of Angola has been like ripples in a pond. We've been doing and such a wonderful team of community members, scholars, and others have been creating, of course, technical reports, conference papers, peer-reviewed articles, essays, right, the scholarly materials, but also documentaries, uh, films, media accounts, uh, a folk song, uh, poems, spoken word poetry, the heritage signs that luckily uh, Daphne Towns were able to see and new signs that are going up with Riverwalk and visit tourism, uh, visit Florida, encouraging tourism. And the bottom left, you see my children at a young age, right? Trying to make sure kids know this and we wanna just make sure more and more people know of this fantastic history. And I hope that this uh, presentation inspires you to seek out those materials and to learn more about the future of Florida from this past. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your time. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Brown. So we did receive um, a few questions that we can go ahead and um, address uh, if you have time. Um, so uh, the first couple questions I will preface, um, they came from Rick Kilby, who has actually published a couple of books on Florida Springs. So your discovery of the well piqued his interest. So um, he has a thought, he says, um, it's my understanding that the uh, Seminoles saw the springs as sacred places. Is it possible they created the well for utilitarian purposes because the spring was considered sacred? That is a really good point. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's one of the things we were trying to kind of make sense of, right? The water's there for the spring. And so we kind of have been, you know, the team and others and you know, sharing this, you know, one thought was maybe, well, this, it was more controlled and maybe there was protection around the spring. So in the concerns about uh, slave raiders, uh, but, you know, it was hard to really make that argument. It, it seemed weak uh, in every way. The idea of a sacred place uh, and then a more utilitarian purpose actually works well with the other finds we had at this, uh, that ritual area. So I'm gonna jot that one down. And if you can find my email and share more thoughts, I would really uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I can definitely connect you too. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know his work. So it's, it's, oh, an, honor. <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> I always trust audiences. It's been my, my philosophy. You never know who might show up. Exactly. Now, we do know that one of the things when they got to Andros Island, uh, they built a well almost immediately and both for practical purposes, obviously, but maybe it did have that kind of sense of knowing how to do this and wanting to do it. And so, yeah, I like that uh, divide. I think that's a really interesting and I'll share that with my team members. 
Um, he's also curious if um, a couple more questions about the spring. Um, were you able to excavate the land directly adjacent to the spring? And then um, is the spring itself being restored as part of the river walk site plans? Yeah, yeah so the spring, uh, well known uh, for the village of Manatee. I mean, they, they very much was, they wrote about it, they mentioned it. Uh, they had a nice gazebo in the late 19th century, and that got rebuilt multiple times. Uh, into the 21st century, uh, we were we excavated uh, near the spring rubble. Everything was rubble. That uh, we don't know the exact. Uh, couldn't make sense of it, uh, but it, it looked like in the mid 20th century, uh, just a real destruction and then leveling up. And we went. It got we went all the way down to the water table and didn't find anything coherent. Uh, the river walk, uh, they, if, if the, river, the spring itself was capped in late 20th century. Uh, the neighbors told me, you know, longtime neighbors uh, said, the city of Brandon didn't like people having access to the water, whether because there's free water or health issues, uh, was never clear. But river walk is uncapping it. It's create, they're creating a pond for it and then a stream that'll go to uh, the Manatee River. And that's one of the reasons we had to excavate because they're, they're digging a really big hole right now. I was there just a couple of days ago. And so we, the digging where we excavated, there's nothing there anymore. So uh, my sense is there probably wouldn't have been that much by the spring, uh, just because water would have come out at different levels and that there's the rubble might've been there to really just kind of control the spring's waters. So they didn't over flood houses uh, that were nearby. So I don't think there was anything right by the spring, but archeologically, uh, if it had been, it's, uh, it's long gone. Um, let's see, Anne asked, um, which of these sites are still being excavated, if any? Yep. So right now, the work that was done uh, is done. It was done last January, luckily before the pandemic, uh, and the lab work is done, and I'm just pulling together a report for the Division of Historical Resources as we speak. Uh, it'll get done soon, and then we're going to just keep on disseminating information. So that work is done, and there's no, nothing to be done anymore. Uh, there's no other projects right now except at DeSoto National Memorial, which is a national park just at the mouth of the Manatee dedicated to Hernando de Soto. At uh, the property, which is a fairly small park, there's a structure, a site known as the Tabby House Ruins. Uh, that has more debate than you ever want to imagine uh, about it. Uh, my sense has been that that place was used by the British to support uh, the, the Marines at the Mountain Marine Spring and elsewhere, but it also was used by Cuban fishermen. It was also a place that in 1840s was used by a, a, a famous uh, white settler of the area, William Shaw, and after he left, it was a tavern and a park. So it's a really complicated material record. Uh, the National Park Service did some excavations a couple of years ago, and they're going back this summer. And that archaeologist has invited me to join her. And we'll see if there's any components there that are connected to uh, the Angola saga. Uh, so there will be some more work done. It, the chance of it actually providing more information is uh, Minor, but you know, archaeology got to try. <laughs> I think that's one of the optimism of archaeology. Um, so I'll just go ahead and throw these last couple of questions out so we can wrap up here. Um, so, um, one, how many people do we know how many people escaped to the Bahamas? And then the other is, um, did you find any pre Columbian artifacts? Let me do the second one first. It's more it chronologically fits. Uh, in the 1930s, there was. Um, resident of Brainton who went around uh, describing archeological sites. Montague Talent was his name. And he actually was uh, found a lot of stuff. That's the easy way to say. He was an archeologist, but he dug up a lot. Uh, there's that, what was called the South Florida Museum. Now the Bishop Museum has a room dedicated to him and the things he found. Uh, he describes a mound by the Manatee Mineral Spring. But in the 1930s, like everywhere in Florida, that mound was taken for roadbed. And by the 1950s, there's no evidence of it. I 
went into this project and I consulted with the Seminole Tribe of Florida Historic Preservation Office, as an archaeologist should. And we just assumed there would be pre-Columbian materials. It's right by the Manatee River. There was a mound nearby. Uh, there's a spring and legends about Native Americans by that spring uh, in Bradenton. Uh, completely surprised that we found no pre-Columbian materials. Uh, right by the river itself, we did find some tools, but they seemed to be part of a fill that was put in much later. It, it wasn't in a coherent area. Someone took a bunch of dirt to help level off the riverbank. And so there are some things, but they're not coherent. Uh, and so I don't know why there was nothing found. It, it, I, I'm, I'm really puzzled. I was expecting it and we just, nothing was there. And as you saw from the, the, the drone, we opened up a lot of area. So it was quite surprising. Uh, the other question, how many escaped? So Cantor Brown Jr. again, oh, this work, Vicki Oldham pulled together, uh, Rosin Howard, who I showed you, uh, Daphne Towns, Sherry Speckus, uh, Cantor Brown Jr., Terry Week, others. So this is a research team. It's, I'm speaking for the team and really for the ancestors uh, that uh, speak through me about this material. Cantor Brown, uh, just using the numbers that we have from Swanee and Prospect Bluff, by the time we get to 1821, there are probably 700 people living south of the Manatee River. So 300 were captured. Some escaped to the center of the state. Uh, the number that we've been using is about 200 escaped to the British Bahamas, mostly to Andros Island, mostly to Red Base. And so it's a fairly large group. Uh, that population just didn't want to interact with too many other people. The west coast of Andros Island, if you know the geography, it's really hard for big ships to get there. It's a really shallow area. And so these are people afraid of US military ships coming after them. So it made sense. Uh, Andros Island is still uh, fairly underpopulated. It was only in the 1960s, there was a road from the east side of Andros to the west side where Red Bays was, or still is. And so they had enough people so that they had uh, new people always to bring in for marriages and offspring, uh, but they were coherently known in Rosna Howard title to a book the Black Seminoles of the Bahamas. And I'll just uh, kind of answer a question you haven't asked. Uh, probably 10 years ago, uh, representatives of the Seminole tribe of Florida went to Red Bays, met with the elders and had discussions about their common ancestors. Uh, that was not a conversation for me to be part of, nor of any other members of the research team. And I have complete respect that that's an internal conversation among the elders of Red Bays, the uh, descendants of the Maroons, and the Seminole tribe of Florida. So they have a sense of how it fits together. It's none of my business. I, I have my own family issues to deal with. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. So I think we'll go ahead and leave it there. So um, just to close out, I wanna thank um, Dr. Baram for joining us and for leading our talk today. I also wanna thank um, everyone for attending today. We hope you found our presentation um, interesting and informative. Uh, before we sign off, I will uh, just highlight a few um, uh, fantastic things that we have upcoming at the museum um, in terms of programming and exhibitions. So um, our newest temporary exhibition uh, entitled Community Five Years After the Pulse Tragedy actually just opened this weekend. It opened yesterday um, and it's going to run through August 15th. So I highly encourage everybody um, to um, to, to visit the museum sometime this summer to see that exhibition. Um, this Friday, uh, June 4th, we'll have our monthly Lunch and Learn program uh, where we will look back over the last five years of collecting and preserving the history surrounding the Pulse tragedy. Um, finally, this Saturday, we're holding our annual Florida Highwaymen event where you can meet um, some of the artists and have an opportunity to actually purchase artwork if anyone's interested in doing that. Um, so I put a couple of links in the chat um, so you can uh, check those out if you're interested in supporting the museum or if you want any information um, about any of our upcoming programs and events. So um, thank you so much, everyone, again, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Baram. And um, I'm going to, Dr. Baram, you can feel free to sign off whenever. I'm going to leave this open just for another minute so people can grab those links if they want. And um, we'll talk again soon, hopefully. <laughs>